Hello, Miss England's class. Welcome to the BFG. Okay, we're going to read today, and there were quite a few words right there that we have in this chapter that I wondered if you knew or not. So we're going to go over these really quickly before we start reading. Um, just one chapter today. The chapter is called The Royal Breakfast. So we've got butler is the first word. Now, um, a butler is a male servant of a large household that's typically in charge of a lot of things. He's often in charge of the front of the house, like the parlor where people will come in. He's um, sometimes in charge of the dining room. He's in charge of important parts of the house. Sometimes he's in charge of the whole house. But he's a male servant that does a lot in a large household. Footman. A footman is just a male servant that does other things. So often they'll like wait tables or they'll move things or they'll take care of what needs to be done. They're a male servant in a household. The butler's um, like often a higher servant. So they um, do maybe a little more important things. Um, de I think that's pronounced demusk. Demusk. Um, Damask is a pattern. It's a fancy pattern that looks kind of floral and um, it's usually a pretty color and it's often what it goes on a tablecloth. So in the story they're going to put out a damask like um, tablecloth. That's what this is. It's just like a very pretty fancy tablecloth. Um, Next word is cardigan. A cardigan is just a sweater with buttons or a zipper up the front. Disdainful. Disdainful is lacking respect. So if you looked at someone in a disdainful way, it's like lack of respect. You don't really have respect for them. Or, yeah, you're just, you're not being respectful in the way that you're treating them. Disdainful. The next word is acrobat. An acrobat is someone who does tricks in the air. Then the last word is receiver. Now um, there's a lot of different kinds of receivers but in this case the the context that receiver is used in the text is the receiver on a phone. Now this is this book was written before cell phones so there were no cell phones but there was phones. So as they picked up a phone, the phone had a cord that connected it to the box part of the phone. And so they would pick it up like this, and then this was the receiver. It had a speaker at the ear and a speaker at the mouth, and they would receive messages through this receiver. So the queen in our story is going to use the receiver of a phone. And that's what she's talking about, It's the receiver. Okay. The Royal Breakfast. On my copy, it's page 162, but um, you can just look for The Royal Breakfast if you have a copy that has different page numbers. There was a frantic scurry among the palace servants when orders were received from the queen that a 24-foot giant must be seated with her majesty in the great ballroom within the next half hour. The Butler, an imposing personage named Mr. Tibbs, was in supreme command of all the palace servants, and he did the best he could in the short time available. So we learned something about Mr. Tibbs. It says he's in supreme command, so he's in charge of all the servants. So remember how I said that a butler kind of did more important things, sometimes he was in charge of the whole thing? Sounds like in this context, Mr. Tibbs is in, he's the servant that's in charge of all the servants. So he's helping everybody out, like tell, telling them what to do, getting things organized. He's in charge of the house. A man does not rise to become the queen's butler unless he is gifted with extraordinary ingenuity, adaptability, versatility, dexterity, cunning, sophistication, sagacity, and, um, discretion, and a host of other talents that neither you nor I possess. Mr. Tibbs had them all. He was in the butler's pantry, sipping an early morning glass of light ale when the order reached him. In a split second, he had made the following calculations in his head. If a normal six-foot man 
requires a three foot high table to eat off, a 24 foot giant would require a 12 foot high table. If a six foot man requires a chair with a two foot high seat, a 24 foot giant would require a chair with a eight foot high seat. Everything Mr. Tibbs told himself must be multiplied by four. Two be breakfast eggs must become eight. Two times four is eight. Four rashers of bacon must become sixteen. Three pieces of toast must become twelve, and so on. These calculations about food were immediately passed on to Monsieur Papillon, the royal chef. Mr. Tibbs skimmed into the ballroom. Butlers don't walk. They skim over the ground, followed by a whole army of footmen. The footmen all wore knee breechers, and each one of them displayed beautifully rounded calves and ankles. There is no way you can become a royal footman unless you have a well-turned ankle. It is the first thing they look at when you are interviewed. Push the grand piano into the center of the room. Mr. Tibbs whispered. Butlers never raise their voices above a softest whisper, but I'm not going to whisper my voice because then you won't hear me, okay? Four footmen move the piano. Now fetch a large chest of drawers and put it on top of the piano, Mr. Tibbs whispered. Three footmen fetched a very fine Chippendale mahogany chest of drawers and placed it on top of the piano. So they've got a piano, a chest of drawers is like a dresser, okay? That will be his chair, Mr. Tibbs whispered. It's exactly eight feet off the ground. Now we shall make a table upon which this gentleman may eat his breakfast in comfort. Fetch me four very tall grandfather clocks. Grandfather clocks is a long skinny clock, it's about, ten, it's about six feet-ish, eight feet-ish. There are plenty of them around the palace. Let each clock be 12 foot feet high. So we learned the, the clock is 12 foot high, feet high. Whatever they're going to do with these four clocks. Okay. 16 footmen spread out around the palace to find the clocks. They were not easy to carry and required four footmen to each one. Place the four clocks in a rectangle 8 feet by 4 alongside the grand piano. Mr. Tibbs whispered. The footman did so. Now fetch me the young prince's ping-pong table, Mr. Tibbs whispered. The ping-pong table was carried in. Unscrew its legs and take them away, Mr. Tibbs whispered. This was done. Now place the ping-pong table on top of the four grandfather clocks, Mr. Tibbs whispered. To manage this, the footman had to stand on step ladders. So you've got grandfather clocks with a ping pong table on top of it. So that table would be 12 feet high. Mr. Tibbs stood back to survey the new furniture. None of it is in the classic style, he whispered, but it will have to do. He gave orders that a damask tablecloth so it's a fancy floral tablecloth, be draped over the ping-pong table, and in the end, it looked really quite elegant after all. At this point, Mr. Tibbs was seen to hesitate. The footmen all stared at him, aghast. Butlers never hesitate, not even when they are faced with the most impossible problems. It's their job to be totally decisive at all times. Knives and forks and spoons, Mr. Tibbs, What's heard to mutter? Our cutlery will be like little pins in his hands. But Mr. Tibbs didn't hesitate for long. Tell the head gardener, he whispered, that I require immediately a brand new unused garden fork and also a spade, those little shovels. And for a knife we shall use the great sword hanging on the wall in the morning room. But clean the sword well first. It was last used to cut off the head of King Charles I, and there still may be a little dried blood on the blade. 
so they're trying to find utensils that are big enough. When all this had been accomplished, Mr. Tibbs stood near the center of the ballroom, casting his expert butler eye over, over the scene. Had he forgotten anything? He certainly had. What about a coffee cup for the large gentleman? Fetch me, he whispered, the biggest jug you can find in the kitchen. A splendid one-gallon porcelain water jug was brought in and placed on the giant's table beside the garden fork, beside the garden fork and the garden spade and the great sword. So much for the giant. Mr. Tibbs then had the footman move a small, delicate table and two chairs alongside the giant's table. This was for the queen and for Sophie. The fact that the giant's table and the chair and chair towered far above the smaller table simply could not be helped. All these arrangements were only just completed when the queen, now fully dressed in a trim skirt and cashmere cardigan, entered the ballroom holding Sophie by the hand. A pretty blue dress that had once belonged to one of the princesses had been found for Sophie. And to make her look prettier still, the queen had picked up a superb sapphire brooch from her dressing table and had pinned it on the left side of Sophie's chest. The big, friendly giant followed behind them, but he had an awful job getting through the door. He had to squeeze himself through on his hands and knees, with two footmen pushing him from behind and two pulling from the front. But he got through in the end. He had removed his black cloak and got rid of his trumpet, and now and was now wearing his ordinary simple clothes. As he walked across the ballroom, he had to stop quite a lot to avoid hitting the ceiling. Because of this, he failed to notice an enormous crystal chandelier. Chandelier is like a huge big light with lots of crystals on it. Crash went his head right into the chandelier. A shower of glass fell upon the poor BFG. Gungummers and bogwinkles, he cried. What was that? It was Louis the Fifteenth, the queen said, looking slightly put out. He's never been in a house before, Sophie said. Mr. Tibbs scowled. He directed four footmen to clear up the mess, and then, with a disdainful little wave of the hand, he indicated to the giant that he should see himself on top of the chest of drawers, on top of the grand piano. What is a fizzwigzing, flushbunking seat? cried the BFG. I is going to be bugged as a snug in a rut up here. Does he always speak like that? the queen asked. Quite often, Sophie said. He gets tangled up with his words. The BFG sat down on the chest of drawers piano and gazed in wonder around the great ballroom. My gumdrops! he cried. What a spiffling wopsy room we is in. It is so gigantuous. I is needing bicirculars and telescopes to see what is going on at the other end. The footman arrived carrying silver trays with fried eggs, bacon, sausages, and fried potatoes. At this point, Mr. Tibbs suddenly realized that in order to serve the BFG at his 12-foot-high grandfather clock table, he would have to climb to the top of one of the tall stepladders. What is more, he must do it balancing on a hu balancing a huge warm plate on the palm of one hand and holding a gigantic silver coffee pot in the other. A normal man would have flinched at the thought of it, but good butlers never flinch. Up he went, up and up and up, while the queen and Sophie watched him with great interest. It is possible they were both secretly hoping he would lose his balance and go crashing to the floor. But good butlers never crash. At the top of the ladder, Mr. Tibbs, balancing like an acrobat, poured the BFG's coffee, coffee and placed the enormous plate before him. 
On the plate were eight eggs, 12 sausages, 16 rashers of bacon, and a heap of fried potatoes. What is this, please, your majesty? the BFG asked, peering down at the queen. He's never eaten anything except snozcumbers before in his life, Sophie explained. They taste revolting. They don't seem to have stunted his growth, the queen said. The BFG grabbed the garden spade and scooped up all the eggs, sausages, bacon, and potatoes in one go and shoveled them into his enormous mouth. By goggles, he cried. This stuff is making snozcumbers taste like squatch wallop. The queen glanced up, frowning. Mr. Tibbs looked down at his shoes, and his lips moved in silent prayer. That was only one titchy little bite, the BFG says. Is you having any more of this delunctious gumble in your cupboards, Magister? Tibbs, the queen said, showing true regal hospitality. Fetch the gentleman another dozen fried eggs and a dozen sausages. Mr. Tibbs swam out of the room, muttering unspeakable words to himself and wiping his brow with a white handkerchief. The BFG lifted the huge jug and took a swallow. Ouch! he cried, blowing a mouthful across the ballroom. Please, what is this horrible squill pig? I am eyes drinking, Magister. It's coffee, the BFG, the queen told him, freshly roasted. It's filthsome, the BFG cried out. Where is the frob scuttle? The what? The queen asked. The lumptious, fizzy frob scuttle, the BFG answered. Everyone must be drinking frob scuttle with breakfast, Magister. Then we all can be whiz-popping happily together afterward. What does he mean, the queen said, frowning at Sophie. What is whiz-popping? Sophie kept a very straight face. BFG, she said, there is no frob scuttle here, and whiz popping is strictly forbidden. Do you guys remember what whiz popping is? What? cried the BFG. No frob scuttle? No whiz popping? No galumptuous music? No boom, boom, boom? Absolutely not, Sophie told him firmly. If he wants to sing, please don't stop him, the queen said. So for those of you who maybe don't remember, whiz popping is like, it's like farting. So he would drink that frob scot on the bubbles would go down. Remember how funny that was? And the queen thinks he's going to sing a song. He doesn't want to sing, Sophie said. He said he wants to make music, the queen went on. Shall I send for a violin? No, your majesty, Sophie said. He's only joking. A sly little smile crossed the BFG's face. Listen, he said, peering down at Sophie. If they isn't having any frob scuttle here in the palace, I can still go whiz-popping perfectly well without it if I is trying hard enough. No, cried Sophie, don't. You're not to, I beg you. Music is very good for the digestion, the queen said. When I'm up in Scotland, they play the bagpipes outside the window while I'm eating. Do play something. I has her majesty's permission, cried the BFG, and all at once he let fly with a whiz popper that sounded like a bomb had exploded in the room. Woo. The queen jumped. Whoopee! shouted the BFG. That is better than bagged pipes, is it not, Magister? It took the queen a few seconds to get over the shock. I prefer the bagpipes, she said but she couldn't stop herself smiling. During the next 20 minutes, a whole relay of footmen were kept busy hurrying to and from the kitchen, carrying third helpings and fourth helpings and fifth helpings of fried eggs and sausages for the ravenous and delighted BFG. When the BFG had consumed his 72nd fried egg, Mr. Tibbs sided up to the queen. He bent low from the waist and whispered in her ear. Chef sends his apologies, your majesty, and he says he has no more eggs in the kitchen. What's wrong with the hens? The queen said, 
Nothing's wrong with the hens, your majesty, Mr. Tibbs whispered. Then tell them to lay more, the queen said. She looked up at the BFG. Have some toast and marmalade while you're waiting, she said to him. The toast is finished, Mr. Tibbs whispered, and the chef says there is no more bread. Tell him to bake more, the queen said. While all this was going on, Sophie had been telling the queen everything, absolutely everything, about her visit to Giant Country. The queen listened, appalled. When Sophie had finished, the queen looked up at the BFG who was sitting high above her. He was now eating a sponge cake. Big friendly giant, she said. Last night, those man-eating brutes came to England. Do you remember where they went the night before? The BFG put a whole round sponge cake into his mouth and chewed it slowly while he thought about this question. Yes, Magister, he said. I do think I is remembering where they said they was going the night before last. They was galloping off to Sweden for the Sweden sour taste. Fetch me a telephone, the queen commanded. Mr. Tibbs placed the instrument on the table. The queen lifted the receiver. Let me get the king of Sweden. Get me the king of Sweden, she said. Good morning, the queen said. Is everything all right in Sweden? Everything is terrible, the king of Sweden answered. There is panic in the capital. Two nights ago, 26 of my loyal subjects disappeared. My whole country is in a panic. 26 loyal subjects were all eaten by giants, the queen said. Apparently, they like the taste of Swedes. Why do they like the taste of Swedes? the king asked. Because the Swedes of Sweden have a sweet and sour taste. So says the BFG, the queen said. I don't know what you're talking about, the king said, growing testy. It's hardly a joking matter when one loyal subject when one's loyal subjects are being eaten like popcorn. They've eaten mine as well, the queen said. Who's they, for heaven's sakes? The king asked. Giants, the queen said. Look here, the king said. Are you feeling all right? It's been a rough morning, the queen said. First I had a horrible nightmare, and then my maid dropped my breakfast, and now I've got a giant on the piano. You need a doctor quick, cried the king. I'll be all right, the queen said. I must go now. Thanks for your help. She replaced the receiver. Your BFG is right, the queen said to Sophie. Those nine man-eating brutes did go to Sweden. It's horrible, Sophie said. Please stop them, your majesty. I'd like to make one more check before I call out the troops, the queen said. Once more, she looked up at the BFG. He was eating donuts now, popping them into his mouth, ten at a time, like peas. Think hard, BFG, she said. Where did those horrid giants say they were galloping off to three nights ago? The BFG thought long and hard. Ho, ho, he cried at last. Yes, I is remembering. Where? asked the queen. One was off to Baghdad, the BFG said. As they is galloping past my cave, Flesh Lump Eater is waving his arms and shouting at me. I is off to Baghdad, and I is going to Baghdad and Mum, and every one of their ten children as well. Once more, the queen lifted the receiver. Get me the Lord Mayor of Baghdad, she said. If they don't have a Lord Mayor, get me the next best thing. In five seconds, a voice was on the line. Here is the Sultan of Baghdad speaking, the voice said. Listen, Sultan, the queen, queen said. Did anything go un anything unpleasant happen in your city three nights ago? Um, every night unpleasant things are happening in Baghdad, the Sultan said. We are chopping off people's heads like you are chopping parsley. I've never chopped parsley in my life, the queen said. I want to know if anyone has disappeared recently in Baghdad. Only my uncle, Caliph Rahun al-Rashid, the sultan said. He disappeared from his bed three nights ago, together with his wife and ten children. There you is, cried the BFG. 
whose wonderful ears enabled him to hear what the sultan was saying to the queen on the telephone. Flesh Lump Eater did that one. He went off to Baghdad, to Baghdad and Mum, and all the little kiddles. The queen replaced the receiver. That proves it, she said, looking up at the BFG. Your story is apparently quite true. Summon the head of the army and the head of the air force immediately.